welcome to the Difficult Conversations podcast series with me, Poppy Gerard Abbott, PhD researcher at the University of Edinburgh. And this podcast focuses on creating content around COVID-19. It's been born from the pandemic and it aims to create sociological and feminist approaches and also less represented angles on the pandemic. Today, we will be talking about COVID-19 and women's circles. So a slightly unusual topic. And joining me today is our very special guest, Sarah, who will be uh, saying a little bit more about her and her work in a second. And the reason why I invited her on the podcast is, uh, as you all know, listeners, COVID is an extremely difficult time for everybody, but it also disproportionately affects women and affects home life due to lockdown policies. And as we're increasingly moving um, our, our lives, Um, and our support services and our work online. Uh, We're really interested to hear how that all intersects um, Sarah's work. So welcome, Sarah, to the Difficult Conversations podcast series. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you. So if you could uh, kick us off uh, by telling us a little bit about uh, your journey to your work um, and just give our listeners a bit of a taste for all of the different amazing things that you do, including running women's circles. So, yeah, I run women's circles, but my journey probably started. I used to work for the police in their control room um, and I became pregnant. And after I had my boy, I developed postnatal depression and I discovered that the structures that were there to care for me weren't there. Um, So I kind of moved into alternate circles, basically, and that moved me into women's circles. I took a journey into the spiritual through yoga and that sort of led me to discovering women's circles and the wonder of them and just how powerful it was to be held by other women in circle and like holding that space. And there was nothing a bit like it in my area when I started out. I think a few are popping up now. Um, I live in Fife in Scotland. And yeah, um, I started my own about a year and a bit ago and they've been going great. Um, so yeah, that would be about my, my work. I also teach children's yoga classes as well, baby and children's yoga classes. Um, because yeah, that was, that was my deep dive into it. Basically, I took everything on all at once and I'm training to be a shamanic practitioner as well. Yeah. Because I've just taken a deep dive into the spiritual and the feminist spiritual as well, I suppose. Yeah. Wow, there's just so much to unpack there. Um, I'm so interested in women's circles, um, obviously, from from a feminist perspective, being a feminist activist and a feminist researcher. And I will tell you why. So this is a kind of uh, an experience that encapsulates uh, my beliefs quite well. So a few years ago, when I was living in London, I was, I can't remember the name of the feminist collective I was at, but I met a woman and I was just chatting whilst we were waiting for an event to begin. And she said to me, um, uh, women should create circles that are their own. They should create spaces that are dominated by women and led by women and that are only uh, for women because patriarchy has been ongoing for, for hundreds, potentially even thousands of years. Men have always been doing this stuff. Men have always been perpetrating gender-based violence and we keep reacting, reacting, reacting. And whilst that reactionary role is really important, we also need a creative role where we create spaces that um, exemplify the world that we would like to see and I suppose that's my if I was to say what un, what belief underpins my reasons for attending feminist uh, sorry women's circles and also my reason for running them myself so um, just to say to our listeners I also run some of my own women's circles that tend to focus on coping with experiences of sexual and gender-based violence but what would you say um, Sarah are the beliefs that underpin um, your women's circles and your reasons for, for running them so I think I had like a, a second sub question to my first question there I don't know whether you have that in front of you but um, what, what beliefs would you would you say underpin all of this? Well, I suppose I'm probably coming at it from a very feminist background as well. When I worked in the police, I was very much part of um, their their women's sort of development sort of organisation. And I was campaigning for equality within the police force as well. Um, after I came out of when I sort of when I came out of the police, I came out because basically their family friendly policies, I found from my experience where they just paid lip service to it quite, quite honestly. Um, and I moved into sort of 
developing the spiritual and with the spiritual as well. It's like just having women together working on their own spiritual development, not necessarily any particular religion, just working on getting to know themselves and getting to develop themselves is the sort of beliefs that I sort of work with with my women's circles. Um, because if you look, if I look at my sort of feminist journey, I suppose I've come full circle from like, you know, in the 90s, it was all about ladette culture. And then in the noughties, I suppose it was quite all sex in the city-ish. And it was like really sort of like, you know, going out there and proving that anything men could do, I could do just as well. And actually, as I've come round to motherhood and everything like that, I've also discovered that actually, do you know what? It's not about competing with men. It's about being we are different to them, being different to them and like, you know, celebrating the differences and working with that and bringing that into society because feminist values or feminine values, not even feminist values, feminine values aren't celebrated as much as the male values, the, the masculine values. Absolutely. And there are many feminists that would argue that is the logic that underpins the patriarchal order that um the kind of symbols that are attached to uh, masculinity and to femininity that that masculine qualities uh, and skills and attributes are venerated and celebrated and women's not necessarily women's but feminine um attributes uh, and qualities are subordinated that's that's a really important point and um, if it's okay sarah i'm actually going to move to um our third question yep. which is um uh, what do women's circles bring to a time of personal and global crisis. So what do you think the um, purposes of women's circles um, in general? I mean, you've already touched on this perhaps a bit, but like, why are they kind of especially relevant during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I think society is kind of falling down at the moment, isn't it? Like, you know, everything, all these structures that were meant to be working and in place just aren't at the moment. We've been told to separate and we are a community species. So I suppose women's circles are really important just now because it does bring a sense of togetherness for women that can meet online. And it's not the same as in person. It's, it's I, I wouldn't even pretend that it is, but actually it works quite well that with the technologies that we've got now, we can see each other's faces, we can see each other's expressions, we can share how we're feeling. There's a sense of like, you know, shared sort of, you know, going through that sort of sharing experience, it's, it helps us sort of reassure each other, basically. It's sort of like, you know, the... I suppose the validation that we need that we are not not coping like everyone's doing the same thing um and there's also the the sense of it actually brings a hope for the future as well there's a hope that actually we can rebuild something better when this is all over um I'm not saying that like you know this is a good thing covid-19 is not a good thing in the slightest but there is the very real possibility that we could actually build on it and build on building something better when it's all over. Yes, absolutely. I think that goes back to what we've already briefly mentioned about kind of creating a space of what we would like to see. Yeah, we've got that kind of scary patriarchal order outside of the women's circles, but inside the women's circles, we can perform and enact and use our imaginations to create a world that we would like to see. I do find that they tend to have that strong imaginative aspect to them. And I can imagine just off the top of my head, some of the reasons why women's circles would be so important right now. So women, um, as, as you may or may not know, Sarah and listeners, um, Women are disproportionately shouldering the labour around COVID, so domestic labour, reproductive labour, community work. Women are are feeling the impacts of um, of COVID nineteen to some of the greatest extents, and they do need spaces to offload about that and 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 heal. And also, rates of gender based violence will increase during this time, particularly domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and cyber violence. And um, I think women's circles can provide a space where you can comfortably talk about um, those experiences um, to a group of women who are empathetic and are there to listen and will understand. Yes, definitely. I think that is very important. Um, you mentioned cyber violence. Like, you know, I, I like I have Internet spaces as well that are women only because basically it's, it's a safe place for women to come and share with themselves as well. Um, it's funny, there's like local community spaces in our area and it's funny the amount of sort of trolling that goes on in them. And, you know, you put a question up and you're perfectly sort of you're you're 
valid and asking that question and then you just get shot down especially it tends to be men that do it but other women do it as well so I have safe spaces for our local area um, that women can come into with set rules of basically being kind and if we keep kindness at this, the core then I think it really helps and the spaces really help as well. So what would you say, so going back to my my second question, uh, why do you, have you continued to run women's circles during the pandemic, uh, even though face-to-face -face interactions aren't possible? How have you managed to adapt uh, some of your work to online means? Although it sounds like your work was already uh, intersecting both face-to-face um, -face and online previously. So do you already perhaps possess a pre-existing skill set? I had started my online women's circles in December of 2019, actually. I decided that I wanted to move online as well because for a lot of the women that were in my sort of group, um, some of them couldn't commit to coming out in an evening because child because of childcare or other reasons they can't leave the house or they lived that wee bit too far away. So I decided that I was going to move on to online circles as well as in-person circles back then, which is kind of um, prescient really to what's happened. I actually took my foot off the gas for a while, didn't have one for a while. And then when when um, lockdown happened, I moved my first circle online. Um, and I, I already had the, the sort of skills to use that because I've been using my online groups and I'd been using Zoom calls as well for um, other, I'm in group coaching programs myself, myself and I'm in my own circles like that I go to to be held in space. So I knew how to do that, which was really great. And it's just convincing women that like are a bit unsure of it, that actually coming online and sharing that space it is a safe space. Um, I know there's been a lot of issues about sort of thinking about privacy and Zoom, but actually they've really locked down on that. And there's met, there's sort of there's things that we can do as facilitators to make sure that the, the meetings are safe. I lock all of my meetings once I know that everyone's going to come in. So there will be no extra people coming and joining us. Um, yeah, it's such a minefield, isn't it? The security issues that are gendered and how you're more likely to face risks to your to your online security whether that's as a you know within a women's circle or just as a woman on the internet you have to consider all of these um potential scenarios um i, I find that it can really increase uh, my mental load so for example um I'm involved in two research projects on gender-based violence at the moment, one that's Scottish government funded and another one that's my, my own PhD. And I've had to move them online because of the pandemic. And the, the number of, um, of cyber-related issues that you have to, and security-related issues that you have to consider because of the sensitivity of the topics and because you're likely to get trolls and misogynists, and you have to promise the people in those spaces that it's going to be safe. Um, I, I found it really, really um, stressful. Um, but but maybe because you you started off with having them online, it, it was a bit of a kind of you were eased into it a bit better than if, if it was like watershed, you know, before you were carrying out your work entirely face to face. And then all of a sudden you went online. I think it was definitely a benefit that I had done the online things before. Um, it's... It's very much like a learning process. It's like every day you're learning something new, though, which is which is understandable. Um, and yeah, in my sort of day to day life, like with things that I post on Instagram on my on my business pages and things, I'll get guys coming into my inbox. Most of them just say hi, actually. But it's like they're just saying hi and I don't know them and they're not my demographic of people that I'm trying to target. And actually, it's a wee bit weird and a wee bit creepy. <laughs> I just block them. Um, but yeah, um, I, it's definitely a learning curve. It's definitely something that we're going to have to be aware of as time goes on. Um, we need to keep safe spaces. We need to be aware that we're keeping safe, safe spaces, not even just for people that are in our circles, but for ourselves as well. Because like you say, the mental loads, having to deal with all of that, it's a lot of extra stuff that, let's be frank, men don't have to deal with quite as much. Absolutely. Um 
Before we move on to the next question, I would really like to um, just ask you a spontaneous question, if that's okay. Can you give um, me and, and the listeners a bit more information about the specifics of uh, how you run your women's circles? So, for example, I always start off with um, some sort of icebreaker and I kind of ease people in because the my women's circles are like are very sensitive and intense because they focus on uh, sexual violence, gender-based violence, rape and so on. I, I then kind of ease people in and use um, like props to centre the conversation, like mm -hmm. a picture or a toy or something like that. Can you um, reveal as much or as little as you like about how you actually run your women's circles? Yeah, uh, to be honest, we run, we go with icebreaker questions as well. It's a great thing because it's not always the same women that come. And we always ask people why they want to come, like what's brought them to circle. And um, they're willing to share that. If they're willing to share that at the start, then that's great. What, as our circle goes on, we work a lot with ritual um, based sort of activity. So we'll look at a subject and we'll then do some sort of, we'll sort of figure out what our issues with it are. And then we'll do some sort of ritual to release or let go or to sort of manifest more of something coming into our lives um we always have a sharing bit where we can just talk about whatever we want to and um, i use um oracle cards as a sort of prompting thing for that so it's pictures basically someone picks out a picture and um of, out of a deck of oracle cards and i use animal based ones and basically looking at the animal then they say whatever comes to their mind we just feel let them go with the flow basically and it, it tends to be that whatever that animal sort of represents to them it clicks with stuff in their mind so that basically they end up talking about what they needed to talk about, even if they didn't know it before they came. I can imagine that the use of such props is really effective. Even if you don't believe in the kind of spiritual side of that stuff, you can still use it as a mirror, right, to look into um, your emotional state. And when you use pictures, things will jump out to people that will be very telling about where they are in their life or what they'd like to talk about, etc. So that, that sounds like a really, um, a really interesting and, and effective tool to yeah, use. It mm. definitely is. And like you say, I always say to people at the start, like, you know, these are Oracle cards. You can look at them as pictures. You can look at them as sort of oracle cards. Um, you can read the description, but I'd ask you not to read the description until after you've spoken because they, will, they all come with a wee booklet that tells you what it's meant to predict. And people believe in that. People don't believe in that. I find that it's it, it tends to work a lot off of archetypes and things like that, even with animals. Um, so it's all sort of like just looking into the psyche more uh, and whether you believe in that spiritual stuff or not, it is a great prompting tool. I think that... It must be so fascinated to hear all of the different reasons why women come to Circle. And I always find great joy in being the chair of Women's Circles because of having the privilege and, and honour of listening um, to those reasons and, and witnessing people being so vulnerable in those moments. Yes, definitely. It's it's an honour to do to sort of be there and to witness that and to share with that. Um, we have to be vulnerable ourselves as facilitators, I believe, in order to sort of help them do that. Um, so I share a lot myself, and then they share a lot, and it's it's it never fails to amaze me how vulnerable people can be, and how open and trusting, and how that actually helps them as well. It's not something where they're coming along and they're sharing and they go away broken. They go away feeling better for it they go away feeling that they've been understood they've been heard they've been validated and that other women understand that it might not be experiences that other women have had but just being heard saying this is my truth that's what's important to them yeah and one of the most profound things that I observe both in attending and running women's circles is the sheer volume of of pressure and stress on women's lives um, whether that's around dieting or gendered roles or all of the unpaid invisible labor that they undertake you know their experiences of 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 violence and everyday sexism and their treatment from colleagues and friends and in, in the community like there's just there's so much pain and and trauma and and stress that's brought to those circles but that's also why they're so 
revolutionary as as this kind of dumping ground for those for those feelings and then almost like a phoenix can can rise from it by the end of all of that that sharing of oppression and trauma and um and stress yes definitely because burying all of those emotions burying all of those experiences is really bad for us and you know it affects us in physical ways as well as mental ways so we end up feeling a lot of pain um if we don't come and share these things it's and the emotional workload as well like you know you hear time and time again about like everything that women have to do and I have mothers coming along to my circle and I'm a mother myself and oh my goodness do I do I sort of understand that emotional workload it's like constantly thinking and constantly having something to worry about all the time it's just so difficult um but sharing in these brilliant spaces eases the burden because you know that you're not alone you know that it's not just you that isn't coping or feels like you aren't coping and actually you're coping great it's just it is hard and linking into um those experiences of, of womanhood that relate to you know reproductive labor and all of the other forms of labor that women undertake i'll move on to our next question which is do you have any opinions about women and their roles in, in fighting and navigating COVID-19? So I've already kind of mentioned a few things that might um, stimulate your thinking in terms of your answer to this question. So, for example, all of the community work that disproportionately falls on women. Uh, do you have anything else to, to say on, on that question? I just think, well, they, they're doing a great job, aren't they? I mean, I'm not personally, I'm personally staying at home and just running my women's circles. I've got my son to deal with, though. He's four years old. He's a wee extrovert and he lives with me, who's, I'd say I'm probably ambivert and my husband, who is an introvert. So he's finding it very difficult and I'm having to deal with the emotional overload of him as well as my own emotional overload and my husband's too. Um, uh, but then out in the community, there are the midwives, there are the health visitors, there are the nurses, the social workers, and they're all working and they're going out to work every day and they're worrying about bringing COVID-19 home to their families, which must be so hard for them. Um, I think that women are doing a great job. Women always do a great job and they don't tend to moan about it a lot. They don't tend to celebrate it either. They just tend to get on and do it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a big believer that um, that women really are at the the forefront of um, battling COVID nineteen, and not just women. Sometimes we talk about um, the gender order in this very dichotomous way of you know men and women, but as you've already said, Sarah, it goes beyond that actually to the symbols of of femininity and masculinity and feminine qualities, and I think it's feminine qualities that have really triumphed um, and really been kind of highlighted during this pan pandemic and, and have come under the microscope for their wonderful qualities, you know, caring, cooperation, nurturing, listening. And as a feminist, I've, I've pondered for, for many years as to whether um, these attributes are something that we should put in a box and put to one side if we want to live in a male dominated world um, or whether the feminist revolution is one where literally we we reconceptualize and re-energize what it means to have these qualities. And um, that leads me on to my question. Um, and this is maybe a little bit more, more philosophical for you. Um, but some feminists argue that um, that the sociocultural um, like connotations and meanings of, of feminine qualities um, and that the the abuse of the the earth and of these qualities are aligned with with the mistreatment and control of women's bodies so they think that there's I hope that makes sense that there's they believe that there's a logic between the ways that we we treat women and the ways that we we treat the earth and, and that we treat these feminine qualities and um, what do you think about any of those um, statements that I've thrown out there because a lot of these themes are explored in women's circles about kind of um, re-remembering and, um, and, and gaining empowerment over um, the feminine and the divine feminine and, and these feminine qualities. Yes, um, I think definitely putting them in a box is not a good idea. Um, I, I've had the same struggle with it. I think, like I said at the start, I started out my journey wanting to prove that I could do everything that a man could do. I 
started because I was a bouncer in my 20s because of that. I was like, I can do this. I can go out and I can hustle a man out of a pub. I can show that I can do all of this stuff. Um, however, the caring, that's important. And it's not just their feminine qualities. They are definitely in the feminine aspect. But I think we harm men as well when we say, let's put these qualities away in a box and try and compete with men on masculine sort of things, because there's men out there that would prefer to do that too. And I think the whole feminist argument is a feminist, is an argument for everyone, not just for women. Um, I, part of my whole the like sort of philosophy is that I'm doing this so that my son can grow up to be whatever he wants to be. If he wants to be, he's a tender, loving, kind little boy. And I want him to keep those qualities. I don't want him to have them stamped out of them, him because he, they're not, they're not boyish qualities, they're girly qualities. Um, when it comes to, the alignment of the abuse of the earth and the sort of abuse of women, then yes, definitely. I think, of course, they they are linked. How could they not be? Um, I come from a sort of, well, I've, I've come to sort of believe in a sort of animist sort of spiritual quality. So basically, everything has spirit within it. And when we look at it from that aspect and when we look at it as in we're looking at each other as human beings, we've all got spirit. We're looking at nature and the earth as having spirit as well. Why would we treat it any differently than we want to be treated ourselves? And that comes back to that's a very sort of I want to care for things. I want to make sure that I want to nurture them. I want to make sure that they are looked after. But then you look at society and society as it is just now it does celebrate the masculine it does celebrate having power over rather than looking after rather than working with rather than being part of it's power over controlling and taking advantage raping and pillaging i suppose as well we do rape and pillage the earth as well it's like you know it's still happening with women today everywhere it's still happening with men today so yeah i was going to say his asset like historically raping and pillaging but it's it's very relevant today as well um it's all aligned. And I think that only with really working with that and actually celebrating those qualities and coming together in circles, the more we come together in circles, the more we talk about it, the more, the more we heal ourselves, we can then go out and help heal the world. I don't think we can really do a lot of activism if we're not looking at ourselves first. That's such an interesting um, comment. Um, you've just linked like individual people to um, the much wider ecosystem and to the whole earth. And that's a connection that not a lot of people can almost make in their minds because mm -hmm. one of the effects of capitalism and of patriarchy is this like individualization, right? And um, and I, I completely agree. I, I do think, I mean, this is maybe more of an eco-feminist argument and I don't, I don't maybe align myself to all aspects of, of eco-feminism because it can become quite what's called essentialist which means mm -hmm. that like assuming that we're all women have these qualities and women equals you know nurturing caring etc yeah. and, and that's not the case we we interact with as you as you've just you know demonstrated when you described your journey of moving from a bouncer to a woman that runs women's circles I mean what a journey you yeah. as a woman <laughs> you have embraced so many different moments and identities of masculinity and femininity in your life and we move fluidly between them and but I do think that especially amidst kind of um, this pandemic, which is an, an environmental crisis, as much as it is a, a health and economic and social and political and so on, it is an, an environmental crisis that um, originated through um, the kind of kind of invasion of nature. Um, this mm. is one of many pandemics that have been caused by us over harvesting nature and manipulating nature. Um, I think that we need to confront the genesis of of the pan, of, of pandemics in that way, you know how that does relate to humans' relationships with nature, and also yeah. obviously in the midst of the climate change crisis. Um, I think it's so interesting to bring up these these feminist arguments around like why is it that that women are being mistreated and the earth is being mistreated? What 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 links can we make that we that we live in a, in a world where the earth is subordinated and women are are who are you know. Uh, seen as having these kind of earthly qualities, the qualities of the earth, they're also subordinated. I think there's quite a clear logic there. There definitely is. There definitely is. And it's like, you know, 
when you're talking about, I, I don't think I probably subscribe to all of the eco-feminist arguments either. Um, I do believe that we are linked with, I think, as, as a planet, as a sort of, you know, as a species, we're linked with the world. I think quite often we take ourselves apart from from nature. And I don't think that that's right. I think we are part of nature. And if we work with nature, then I think it's going to be great. But isn't it isn't it strange that, like, you know, it's taken a global pandemic that um, is affecting humanity for us to shut down and actually start like, you know, looking at like, like really take action, whereas global warming, we've been talking about that for decades and people are still arguing about it. And really, we need to be taking action about that as well. Well, that leads me very nicely onto my final question for you, Sarah, which is um, as healers and, and facilitators, spiritualists and community workers, you know, I think it's fair to say that your your um, your role encompasses so many of those different things. I mean, I could probably use so many other words uh, to describe <laughs> what you do um, in terms of your I mean, what, what's the appropriate word to use here in terms of your sector? Um, what learnings do you hope come from the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, um, you know, what, and, and maybe also to tie into that, like, OK, maybe this should be the first part of the question. What purpose, specific purpose do you see your sector having during this crisis? And then what what uh, learnings are you do you hope your sector will have from the crisis? I think my role during the crisis definitely is providing community, providing that sort of community to share, providing that safe space. And I think going forward, I think. What I would love for this to come out of, what love for it like to come out of this is that communities are important. We need these communities. We need like integrated communities of people working together, not working on their own, trying to prove things, but working together. Um, societies, it is, it doesn't work for everyone. I think we've, we've kind of seen that over time. And like we've seen that very, very, very much so during this pandemic as well. Look at all the people that are needing help from the government just now. Um, and it's not quite happening quite right for any of them. I think we need a lot of conversations coming out of this, a lot of reorganising of society and a lot of emphasis on looking out for each other and looking out for the earth as well. Yes, and I think the um, the increasing popularity of women's circles demonstrates very clearly that women's circles are providing something not just out, you know within the pandemic but outside of the pandemic in general are providing spaces and services that mainstream services aren't providing. You know, I find that the National Health Service doesn't delve into many elements that or even psychotherapy often doesn't delve into the the women centered approaches of of women's circles and and you've already mentioned this the ways that women's circles start with the self you know if you heal the self you're able to be so much more successful and and effective in so many other areas of your life you know and it it sounds like a cliche but like you can't love other people and other things without loving the self and that's that's something that i find is very bespoke to women's circles is it it really centers the self whereas like if you were to go to maybe I don't know a counselor or to just a peer support space or to a doctor with some of the issues that you bring to women's circles then the approaches would maybe not be as holistic and um it would focus on fixing an issue, you know, getting advice or whatever for that specific issue rather than just expressing the self. I, I do find that women's circles have a specific role in wider society, but also in the pandemic. Yes, definitely. And I think like, you know, you're talking about fixing the problem and giving advice. And that's something that definitely as mothers, you get all the time you get advice flung at you, um, which is another thing that drew me to the women's circles in the first place was the fact that, like, you know, we have sharing spaces where there's no advice. We don't give advice. And you can see certain people coming in if they've not been to circles before and they sort of they're sitting on their hands almost or they're trying to give advice, but they know they're not to. It's such a difficult thing for us not to try and instantly fix, but just to sit with and just let it be. And when you're talking about the holistic thing, you're talking about movement, you're talking about integrating your sort of spirit, your body, your mind, your everything. It's just, it's so important. And I do, I do think though that I think slowly, slowly science is catching up with this and it's sort of, the NHS is coming into it as well. It talks a lot about fitness. It talks a lot about that sort of thing. I think 
given time, they will catch up and hopefully they will catch up. But in the meantime, women's circles are there as well. And that's great. Yeah, I mean, we have to be very careful in this work that we're not like undermining or um, delegitimizing the work that, for example, the medicalist and the recommendations of, for example, the medical establishment, because I do think that there are, I mean, as you're probably fully aware, there are elements of the well-being industry that that do um, dangerously tread on, um, for example, medical advice or... And I've um, been snoozing a lot of them on social media recently, actually, because they, they really affect my mental health, actually, when I see them. It actually makes me quite angry. Um, I do think that women's circles are there to be used in conjunction with proper medical care as well. I think if someone's got mental health issues or anything like that, I think medication and talking therapy definitely is important. I think then their emotional, like, you know, women's circles can act, be a definite real add on to it instead of like, you know, saying, come to the women's circle, we'll cure you of everything. I'm not trained to do that. Um, I'm trained just to hold space, to let people express how they feel. I'm not trained to fix. I think it's about making it clear what the purpose and remit of the circle is and seeing it as um, complementary to uh, a wider picture of, of support. But unfortunately, because of living in, you know, times of austerity, people can't always access the support that they need. Mm. Um, so it becomes it becomes complicated in terms of them, you know, coming to the women's circle for, you know, the reasons that they should and then making sure they ring fence, you know, other concerns and needs to other places, but those other mm -hmm. places aren't always providing the support that they need. It's so tricky in terms of, you know, being on the facilitation end of things. It definitely is. I think there's a lot of shortfalls with funding, especially in things like mental health. And I think it's difficult and people might want to come to a women's circle wanting that as a replacement and it's not a replacement it's definitely something that could help but you need to you need to seek appropriate medical help as well i think it comes down to the question why do people turn to alternative spaces and alternative industries and alternative medicines uh, to deal with the health and social problems that they have in their lives and i think for many people they have felt that the mainstream services and established services have let them down and haven't listened to them or haven't had time of the time of day for them. And there's a whole host of, you know, economic and, and political and emotional and institutional reasons why people feel that way. And that ranges from, you know, the effects of austerity where services aren't adequately funded enough to give people the help, support and intervention they need all the way through to um, having um, approaches that um, aren't holistic, um, all the way through to um, some groups of people having, um, you know, relationships of mistrust um, with with authorities, whether that's because, um, you know, they are victim survivors of, of abuse or they belong to uh, black and minority ethnic communities. Um, they can have very strained relationships with, with authorities because of experiences of, of mistreatment from them. So I think there are very legitimate reasons why people do turn to alternative spaces to seek all of um, their, their support um, and to meet all of their needs. Um, but I agree, there should absolutely be a balance between um, finding help that works for you, because that's what it's all about, you know, what works for you. And if alternative uh, spaces work for you, for whatever reason, then that's great, keep using them. And they do work, and they do provide many benefits for many people. But what does that balance look like? Um, you know, is it 60-40? Is it 70-30? Should we be encouraging the use of certain um, more, you know, particularly more fringe alternative spaces at all? Uh, where do we draw the line in terms of alternative services? Do we have the right, um, as people who facilitate alternative spaces, to say, you know, this is what this space is for. You're only allowed to come here to share, not to find uh, X, Y, and Z. That's for you to go to those services for. But then they go to those services and they're mistreated or they can't even access the service. Um, they can't get through. Um, they they don't get the help that they need. Um, they're passed from pillar to post. I think it's really, really difficult. And it's a really good 
Uh, it's a very interesting question, um, you know, really profound question during times of austerity where mainstream services, the services that were are designed historically to to be there to help, you know, for example, the National Health Service are facing such uh, incredible strain that people are now, you know, desperately seeking help in in other places because they can't access um, the uh, the full support that they need. Um, and one of the interesting effects of uh, austerity is that the bar for what is considered as a, a priority or an urgent health need is moved up. So that means that resources are targeted in this very tip of the iceberg way, where only the most urgent and critical cases of you know health or mental health um, are intervened in. But often by then it's it's too late, and a lot of the damage has been done. And beneath that tip of the iceberg is a whole iceberg underneath sea level where if services were able to intervene in preventative ways or during the process of escalation of a health problem or or a mental health crisis or whatever it is then they wouldn't get to that critical um, place that tip of the iceberg in in the first place so I think that there are lots of interesting questions around why people leave mainstream services and just completely lose uh, faith in them and and trust and only go to to alternative spaces but it does present a lot of challenges to facilitators of those spaces because you get people coming with vastly different reasons for coming into those spaces and expectations of what the space is for, what you're trained to do and what you are there for. And I think that this is going to get worse as uh, austerity gets more and more aggressive. Um, you know, they're currently, I feel, laying the groundwork for a serious period of austerity um, following the, the the COVID pandemic. So I think... Um, this, this is likely to, to get worse where uh, boundaries are really going to get blurred in these alternative spaces and, and these alternative spaces are going to have a, a whole host of very serious problems uh, heaped in them without necessarily the, the skills and resources um, uh, and, and boundaries to be able to cope with those problems. Uh, anyway, moving on, because uh, we'll have to, to finish up uh, soon. So maybe just one quick question uh, to finish up, Sarah. So that is, what to you is a feminist space? We'll finish on that. What does that mean to you, a feminist space? It's a space where you're able to express whatever you want to, really, I suppose. Um, from a sort of feminist point, like if you're talking from a woman point of view, maybe it's a, it's a safe space where you feel able to talk about whatever you want. It's a safe space where you can talk about equality it's a safe space, basically. Yeah, a safe space. Mm, yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, for me, it's it's a place where women can be women and they can talk about the trauma and stress and gendered experiences of living in this world without shame and without stigma and without being interrupted um, and without having their experiences delegitimized because everywhere they go, whether that's the internet, the workplace, the street, friendships, nights out, whatever it is, if they start to talk about their lived experience from a gendered perspective, it, it is held to so much scrutiny and, um, you know, they'll face often abuse in response. So for me, it's a space where um, they can talk about uh, these things and it's given truth. It's given almost like testimonial truth and weight and legitimacy um, because women's voices are um, mm -hmm. are not given that testimonial um, value wherever they go in society. So for me, like women's circles are these, you know, and feminist spaces are these little pockets in the world where you can retreat into temporarily. And there's all, all of this kind of criticism of, uh, you know, largely from the far right um, or right-leaning people around safe spaces that, you know, our safe spaces are for snowflakes. And I don't know if you've heard of these narratives, Sarah, you know, and they're, um, you know, they oh. uh, give people an unrealistic expectation, um, pandering to people's needs like their babies. And my answer to that is, is no. I think that's a very poor understanding of what safe spaces are. It's it's a chance to, to have a break from the realities of living in this world, for example, as a woman. Um, and some people need those safe spaces to to literally survive and go back into that world 
Definitely. I, I, and actually, it's, it's a very poor argument from the other point of view is the safe spaces aren't real. Like, you know, everyone knows that a safe space isn't the same as a space in normal society. Um, why would you like, you know, it's you're not pandering to people, you're giving them what they need. And surely everyone should be getting what they need. Well, that's a really powerful note to end on today, Sarah. So thank you so much for giving up some of your precious time. I know that um, you've uh, had so much on your plate recently and obviously you're a mother. So things must be all go, go, go uh, in your life at the moment. So we really recognise how precious your time is. Thank you so much for coming on to the Difficult Conversations podcast. Is there anything uh, you would like to say before signing off today? Any kind of final comments? I think thank you so much for having me. It's been really great talking to you today. That's really about all I've got to say. Okay, nice and simple. Well, thank you, Sarah. I I hope this will give our listeners uh, so much food uh, for thought, you know, um, thinking about the relationship between feminism and COVID, um, get them thinking about feminist perspectives to COVID and get them thinking about mm, maybe ways that they can create their own small corners of the world, like women's spaces where they can be uh, themselves, which I think um, if there's a time uh, to be recommending such a thing uh, now certainly is it in terms of us being in the thick of these very uncertain and difficult times. Uh, So thank you so much, Sarah. You've been listening to the Difficult Conversations podcast. Thank you very much, listeners. See you next time. Thank I think thank you so much for having me. It's been really great talking to you today. That's really about all I've got to say.